Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, today's talk is uh, about challenges, architecture, and solutions for massive scale LBAS deployment at eBay and PayPal. So um, these are some of the numbers that I have to share with you. Uh, uh, some of the numbers have already been shared today morning uh, by our chief architect at uh, Subu uh, at the keynote. So we have about 8,500 hypervisors deployed uh, in our OpenStack environment and production. We have about 300,000 virtual cores. Uh, we have uh, about 70,000 VMs uh, running in OpenStack. Uh, we have over 1.5 petabyte of provisioned block storage and thousands of users. So in our case, our users, since it's a private cloud, our users are mainly uh, business units inside PayPal and eBay. And we are planning to cross the 10K hypervisor mark uh, by the mid of 2015. Um, these numbers are a little out of date, but uh, it's actually 10K because uh, today morning, uh, Subo's presentation was 10K. So I think uh, it's a revised, those are the revised numbers. So we are planning to cross about 10K hypervisor by, the, by mid of 2015. So today's agenda is basically what we want to look at is uh, the LBAS uh, deployment architecture that we follow at eBay and PayPal. Uh, we would also like to uh, go through all the enhancements, enhancements excuse me, that we made uh, in the LBAS v1 API. Uh, we would also want to uh, discuss a little bit about uh, the LBAS v1 integration that we did with Horizon UI. There will be a demo uh, for that. Um, then also, I would like to share um, the challenges that we faced uh, when we had to migrate, um, uh, we had to migrate eBay and PayPal from our proprietary load balancing management system to LBAS. So we had uh, a proprietary load balancing management system that was managing all our LBs in production. So we had to migrate um, all of those load balancers to LBAS. So we had a lot of challenges in that, and we would like to discuss what challenges that we faced. And towards the end, uh, I would like to go over a typical north-south and east-west load balancing traffic topology that we follow at eBay. So this is the LBAS deployment architecture that we have. Uh, that we follow at eBay and PayPal. Uh, on the left, we have a, a bunch of Neutron servers, and and we integrate with two providers. So on the top, we have provider one's top architecture, and on the bottom, we have provider two's architecture. So basically, what we have here is, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, we have an API call that is made by a client, and the Neutron server, what it does is, is basically processes the API call, and it tries to figure out uh, which provider the request is for. Uh, we have made some enhancements to the LBAS scheduler that we'll look later. We'll look at later. And uh, so the scheduler basically decides that if it's provider one, what it does is for provider one, uh, it uh, invokes the provider one plugin and the request is uh, published to the message bus. Then the message bus is uh, uh, stores the message. And on the other side, we have uh, agents running uh, in uh, in HA mode, so we have agents that are consuming uh, these messages from the message bus. So these agents, uh, the way these agents are designed by the provider is that there's a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between one agent and one LB device. So only one agent can talk to a device. So to achieve HA, what we did is we had installed uh, the provider agents on various nodes, and we achieved HA by installing Pacemaker. So uh, basically, via Pacemaker, what we do is we achieve HA, and at any time, one provider is up, uh, one provider agent is up. So let's say, for instance, for some reason, uh, the agent that is live goes down, uh, the Pacemaker tries to bring up um, a second agent uh, uh, so that uh, it, can serve, uh, it can consume the messages from the message bus. So once uh, the provider the agent consumes the message, it uh, calls the LB device and it makes all the changes that is required to be made on the LB device A. And then the device A responds back, and it responds back uh, with the, to the agent, and the agent, basically what it does is it puts uh, the response back onto the message bus, and the message bus is um, basically, there's a consumer on the other side on the provider plugin, which is a callback, and what it does, it, it listens to the message from the message bus, it processes the message and it updates the status of the entity in on the Neutron server. So this is how uh, one of our providers have, we have one of our providers integrated with LBAS. Uh, we have a second provider that uh, we will be integrated soon. That uses a different topology. So the way it works is, let's say for instance, you make an API call to the Neutron server. Here the Neutron server actually also has a scheduler which 
does uh, some uh, analysis on what provider to pick, and then it picks this provider two, for instance. So when it picks provider two, what it does is it goes to the controller, the request, and the controller, basically what it does is it has all the intelligence uh, of, uh, of which LB device to pick, and then basically what it does is it, uh, the controller directly calls the LB device synchronously, and then the device makes all the changes on the device, and then what happens is that the response goes back from the device B to the controller, and then the next thing that the controller does is via the same callback plugin, it actually goes and it updates the Neutron server, uh, the status on the Neutron server. So this is how uh, we have LPAS deployed in production, uh, and this is the architecture that we follow. Uh, so the next slide is uh, basically uh, a list of V1 enhancements that we had to make. So we uh, so we took the LBAS code uh, from the community, but we had a lot of enhancements that we had to make to meet our business needs. Uh, some of these uh, enhancements uh, are, uh, we'll, we'll look at it, we'll double click on each of these in detail. But the first one is basically IP usability for webs. Uh, we have a demo for that. We also uh, added SSL search support. So we added API, CLI, and UI integration support. We have a demo for that as well. Uh, we integrated LBAS with Designate. Uh, we will look at why we did that and how it's working. Um, and then what we did is we added some advanced health monitoring features. Um, we also added a feature where uh, if uh, a member, uh, if we have a member that is associated to a WIP and we have a NOAA instance to attach to it, and if someone goes and deletes the NOAA instance, we will automatically go and remove the member uh, from that from the WIP. So basically, that way, if the NOAA instance is gone, then the WIP does not need the member anymore so that the traffic doesn't go to that member anymore. So we uh, have a feature that we implemented uh, so that uh, we can do that. Um, we also did some advanced uh, LBAS scheduler. We made some changes to the scheduler. Uh, some of the changes are already in deployed in production, but some of the changes we would like to uh, work on it and deploy it uh, on production as well. So let's look at the first thing on IP usability of WIPs. So IP usability of WIPs is basically sharing neutron ports within tenants for multiple WIPs on the same address in different ports. So what this means is basically, let's say for instance, for a given tenant, you have a WIP that is on 10.10.10.10, uh, on and it's uh, running on port 80. So WIP is typically IP colon port. And you already have a WIP under that tenant for 10.10.10 .10 on port 80. Now the same tenant wants to create a WIP on the same IP but on a different port. So that was earlier not possible with V1 APIs, but then we added uh, this feature so that we, so our tenants could do that. So now with this feature, our tenants could do that. So I'll do a quick demo on how, uh, how that works. So here basically if you see, you actually have uh, So sorry, so you had, a, so there's actually already a WIP on associated to 443. Now what I'm doing is basically in the UI, I picked the same IP and now I'm creating a port, uh, creating a WIP on port 80. So it was already there on 443, I'm creating on port 80. Now here I'm going and picking the TCP monitor, I'm adding the instance on the next tab. So if you go back to the LB details, it's basically um, on LB. So it's going to create a port on the same IP. So once I go ahead and create launch, click on launch, it will, what it will do is basically in the background, it sees that this tenant already has a WIP on the same IP but on a different port. So what it will do is it will, it will try to reuse the same IP but on a different port. So earlier there was already a WIP created on 443, so now what it should do is it should create a WIP on port 80. So now if you notice, we have uh, two WIPs here, one is on 443 and one is on 80. So this is how we achieved uh, IP usability for the same, for WIPs, for the same WIPs for the same tenant on different ports. Um, SSL search support for LBAS V1. So uh, V1 API was, uh, we did not have any support for SSL search, but since our, uh, since at eBay and PayPal, our tenants uh, are basically our business units, uh, need a secure uh, way to create WIPs. So they, they needed SSL cert support, they needed LBs to have SSL termination for all their requests. So what we did is we went down and added all APIs to create uh, certs, create keys, and create chains. 
Uh, we also added uh, APIs to associate and disassociate certs from webs. Uh, the other thing that we added is we also added uh, support in the Neutron client uh, CLI support so that the CLI, so we added CLI commands basically uh, to, uh, uh, to create certs, to delete certs, to uh, create keys and uh, create and delete keys and create and delete chains. Uh, what we also added is we integrated the SSL cert APIs with our Horizon UI. Uh, and you'll see a demo for that as well. Um, so let's look at a typical SSL cert workflow and how it works. So uh, a creation workflow, the way we follow is it first creates the cert. So we added an CLI command, uh, LB SSL cert create, uh, which creates the cert. And then we basically um, added a LB SSL key create that creates the key. So the first thing we can do is create the cert. The second thing that we do is create the key. The third thing is we do is create the cert chain. So the chain is actually an optional thing. Uh, if you need a, a cert chain, you will create a cert chain. If you don't need it, you can just use uh, the key and the, and the cert. And the next thing what you do is uh, once you create the cert and the key, you actually associate it to the web. So you use LB web SSL cert associate with that. So that's how our workflow for cert creation and association uh, of cert to web goes. Uh, the next thing is cert deletion workflow. So what we do with cert deletion is we start, uh, we start the other way around where we first disassociate the web from the cert. And then the next thing is we, we delete the key. Uh, we delete the chain if there was one created and then we delete the cert. These dotted lines actually mean that these uh, these key delete, search chain delete, and search delete operations are optional uh, because uh, it's quite possible that you could use the same cert on different webs. So sometimes you just want to dissociate the web uh, from the cert, but you still want to keep the key, so you don't delete the key. You still want to keep the cert, I'm sorry, so you'll still keep them and you won't issue any of the delete commands. This is how our UI looks like. Uh, Horizon is still cert integration UI um, that we have on Horizon. Uh, we here we enter the name uh, of the cert. You we enter the certificate. We enter the key, and uh, and we basically update. And this basically uh, updates the information out on the web. Designate and LBAS integration. So um, the way designated and LBAS integration works is when uh, one any of our tenants uh, calls a CLI to create a web or delete a web. What we do is uh, we have Neutron embed notifications on web creates and web deletes. And what designate on the other side does is uh, designate consumes the notifications to uh, create and delete ANPTR records. So the folks who don't know, uh, designate is a DNS as a service product of OpenStack uh, that manages uh, the DNS uh, system. And it, uh, it's, it has APIs to create and delete A, PTR, and CNAME records. So we have integrated LBAS with designate. So the next thing that I would like to talk is uh, advanced health monitoring. Uh, we added a feature where uh, we could create the health monitor that is shared. So when I say shared health monitor, what I mean is basically uh, we have a flag that is called shared. And these, uh, this flag, when it's set to true, the health monitoring, the health monitors that are created uh, on the LB can be reused by multiple WIPs. So basically, sometimes what we have requirements is some of these monitors, like HTTP, ping, and TCP, those don't change a lot across various WIPs. So when we create them, we create just one of them. So basically, this reduces the number of monitors that we create on the LB device. Uh, we also added uh, customizations on HTTP ECB monitor. Uh, V1 API was missing um, that feature where we could configure the receive string on the uh, on the HTTP ECB monitor. So we added that feature. Um, if we go to the next slide here, uh, this you will see uh, a drop down that says TCP ping HTTP and ECB. So if if in the Horizon UI, if you pick any of these monitors, TCP, ping, or HTTP, it will just use the existing shared monitors. So the shared monitors are created as a part of the onboarding process when we onboard LBs. And uh, if we, the, the next slide actually shows how the HTTP ECV customization works. So when you pick HTTP ECV, what you see is basically you can, we have these configurations. So health check, uh, retry count before markdown and send string were available in v1, but receive string was not available in v1, so we added that feature. So basically what it means is 
uh, our tenants run various applications. The, re the requirement came because we have tenants that run various applications and they want to do uh, monitoring on those applications. So the monitoring, um, those applications, uh, they are different. So they basically what they want to do is they have different endpoints on which they want to do the monitoring. Uh, so, so the endpoint can be configured by, by string string, but when the response comes back from the monitoring, uh, from the monitoring uh, system, what it does is uh, they, the receive string that comes back is different for different applications. So our tenants wanted a way for that to configure. So let's say, for instance, an application uh, says receive string as success. Someone else might say OK. Someone else might say done. So, so, the, so this field basically lets you configure that value. Let's look at a, a, a Horizon LBAS demo. This will basically demo the, uh, uh, the SSL cert uh, integration that we made with uh, between LBAS and Horizon V1. So here, so basically here I have a list of tenants. So I have instance one and instance two created. Uh, these are a list of tenants that I have. So what I would like to do is I would like to create a, a web, a load balancer uh, uh, on top of these two instances. So what I'll go ahead and do is basically I'll just say launch load balancer here. So once I click on launch, launch I'm sorry, once I click on launch load balancer, I can say create new, I can give it a name, uh, test Vancouver demo, uh, LB, demo LB, and um, here I can give it a description. Uh, here I have a list of uh, load balancing methods that I can configure. I have least connection, least sessions, and round robin. I'll just pick round robin. That's the instance port uh, that uh, I want to configure. So that's the port on which I want the service to be on the instance. So I have an, I have the, those two instances. I have uh, application running on ADAT. So I configured ADAT. I'm picking the protocol as HTTP. So when I pick HTTP, I don't see any cert information editable. But when I pick HTTPS, automatically the port changes to 443, and I go back, and now I can actually create a cert. So now I have uh, I'll give it a name, uh, call, and then basically I already have created a self-signed cert. So what I'll do is I have it in my file. So I'll go ahead and copy the cert information from the file, and I'll paste it onto the cert field here. Then I'll go back and copy the key information from here. And this, this is the private key. And this is actually a self-signed cert that I'd created. So I'll copy the key and put it there. And for this one, I won't create any, uh, I won't add any cert chain since it's optional. I will pick, a, a, so TCP, HTTP, and ping, if you notice, if when I pick them, there's no configuration because those are shared monitors in the system. But when I pick ECV, it lets me configure the monitoring. So I can actually configure monitors. So I can say that I want to do health check every five seconds. And after every after three retry counts, I want the LB to mark down the uh, to the member. And I want to do health checks on this endpoint. So I want to send get request on these endpoints. And I'm expecting a response back that is sort of a regular expression that says it has to have success somewhere in, in the response. Here I go ahead and add the two instances. Uh, I can use the same UI to remove the instances. I can uh, add instances. I'll only see instances that are part of my tenant. So now all the information is saved and uh, correct. And now I'll just go ahead and launch the instance. So what this will do is basically this will go ahead and actually create a, a load balancer. If you notice, the load balancer has already been created. Uh, test Vancouver demo LB, and it's on 443. And it has the two instances that I added. And if I copy that address, and if I go to HTTPS, and with that address and port 443, I will actually see uh, a web. And if you notice, it's actually load balancing between uh, 130 and 147, which are the two members that were part that were added to the web. So yeah, so that's the demo. Uh, LBAS scheduler enhancements. So, uh, so, so Neutron LBAS has a scheduler that actually is used to decide uh, which LB, uh, which LB to pick, uh, which LB to make the changes on. So that scheduler uh, 
uh, could have could use a lot of a lot of improvements uh, could be done on the scheduler. Uh, we could have a multi-level scheduling, uh, and we could do scheduling based on various of these factors. We already do the first one where we actually do scheduling based on our class of service, whether uh, the tenant is for a dev class of service, for an external class of service, or a QA class of service or production. There are other attributes that we can consider, like capacity, uh, vendor, and SLA, and tenants. So we can have scheduler announcements on, uh, with those attributes. So let's look at a pictorial view of how an advanced scheduler looks like. Uh, so we have, let's say, for instance, a Neutron server here. Uh, the Neutron server actually has a scheduler in it. So that scheduler could be um, based on class of service. So that scheduler, what it could do is it could determine based on the class of service that the tenant is for. It could pick um, one, of the, one of the providers. So basically, it could pick either a provider one or a provider two based on the class of service. So once it picks provider one or provider two, we could have a second stage of scheduling that goes here, where each of these providers could have their own scheduler. So each of these providers could have their own scheduler, and what they could do is they could have intelligent, excuse me, intelligent algorithm that decides which LB to create the entity on based on factors like capacity, and as we saw, other factors like SLA. So what we can do is uh, here, based on capacity, it can either go to LB1 or LB2, and the second provider could send traffic to, uh, to I'm sorry, would create entities on LB3 or LB4. So with this issue we run into a lot is basically, we have uh, a lot of uh, load balancers in eBay and PayPal, and what happens is that uh, when we, uh, the typical use case is that uh, when a load balancer gets overloaded, it cannot take any more entities because if once it starts, once we start overloading a load balancer, we run into a lot of issues where uh, we see latency in response time, uh, we see uh, the control plane going down on that LB. So we see basically that no entities can be created on LB because of various reasons. So we need some kind of a, some kind of scheduler that does capacity-based scheduling where it knows what's the current capacity on each of these LBs. And if it thinks that one of the LB is over a capacity, over a threshold, then it should not create any more entities on that LB. And it will basically uh, create a uh, user different LB for, uh, for creating uh, all the entities. So this is where our requirements were. So uh, global load balancing. So global load balancing, uh, we, uh, global load balancing is basically we do load balancing traffic across uh, various data centers and regions. So what this means is basically uh, at eBay and PayPal, we have various applications and pools running, but we have them running in various data centers, the same application. And we want a global load balancer to load balance traffic between uh, between these pools on various regions. Um, this is helpful in case when uh, when there's a when there's a data center outage or something where you want the traffic so to be forwarded to not one data center or one region or to the other region. So for that, we use global load balancing. The global load balancer actually acts as an authoritative DNS server for resolving FQDNs to public VIPs. So what happens is that um, is, uh, it, uh, the global load balancer is a smart DNS server. So what it does is you can configure on uh, how the DNS FQDNs resolves on uh, on, the, on the global load balancer. So I'll we'll look at an, uh, a typical topology that we follow at uh, global at eBay and PayPal for, for global load balancing. So what we have here is on the top we have a global load balancer, and we have local load balancers uh, in each of these regions. And then what we have is we have public VIPs that are uh, configured on each of these local load balancers. So what happens is that uh, and then these public VIPs are actually pointing to pools. So pool A is deployed with three VMs, typically we have a lot, but here in this example we have three. So we have uh, three VMs in pool A, three VMs in pool A, and three VMs in pool A, but each of these are in different regions. And we have public VIPs on top of that, and we have a global load balancer on top of that which forwards traffic to each of these things. So now let's look at an example that we, um, let's look at a typical example, that a real world example that we have here at eBay. So at eBay, if you go to search.ebay.com, Search.ebay.com is actually a C name. So it's, uh, if you do an NS lookup on this thing right now, it's actually a C name. And, that C, and the DNS server, the provider DNS server here will have it as a C name. And that C name is pointing to a canonical name called search.g.ebay.com. And search.g.ebay.com is actually hosted on a global load balancer. 
So when you do nslookup on search.e.ebay.com, it will actually return a bunch of public whips. So these public whips are actually whips that we saw in the previous slide here. So these public whips 1, 2, and n, those are that whips. So basically what global load balancing does is it manages, uh, it, um, it decides uh, which public whips uh, to expose in your NS lookup. Uh, so that is what global load balancing does. Uh, so this is the example. So what we want to talk about is, uh, is the entities that are there in the global load balancer. So global load balancer, uh, so global load balancing actually configuration wise there is one DNS side to it, but there's also a load balancing side to it. So what it does is we have various entities that are there in the global load balancer. So one, one entity that we have is global names. Uh, global names are global FQDNs mapped to multiple group pools. So basically, the example that we have, search.g.ebay.com, is actually a global name, and it has two pools, search pool A, search pool B, and these pools are in various data centers. So this is how it's configured. Uh, on a global name, you can actually configure the admin status, true or false, whether you want the global name to be enabled or disabled. You could configure things like LB, load balancing methods, like you want uh, topology, or do you want round robin? You can configure that. So uh, that's global name. Uh, we'll look at what global pools are in the next slide. So global pools are basically a logical group of various public WIPs in each region. So, uh, so basically, we have uh, the search pool. Uh, the search pool is hosted in region A, region B, and that's the and their public IP is public IP A and public WIP B. So this global pool actually configures a list of global members, and the global members, each of these global members, are actually public WIPs for the pool in each of the local regions, in each of the local LBs. So it will have the local LB name, and it will also have the public WIP that uh, is hosted on that local LB. So you have a list of that. The other things that global, uh, uh, global pool um, lets you configure is monitors. So it can do monitoring also on these uh, public WIPs. And uh, the other thing that it can do is it can do, you can configure time to live, that is uh, in seconds as to how much time do you want uh, this is the number of seconds. Uh, uh, number of seconds it takes for any changes that you make under uh, the pool to get reflected on your DNS servers. So that the other ex uh, the other thing that you can configure is max address return. So when you do an NS lookup, when you do an NS lookup on um, search.g.ebay.com, it returns two or three addresses. So that can be configured here. You could add as many members you want here. You could ha you could add ten members here. Or 10 public whips here, but that value controls on how many addresses you want to return back. So, so it's very configurable. Even if you look at it, uh, the this uh, global load balancing, one side is DNS, but the other side is clearly looks like a local LB. Like it has entities, like it has pool entities, it has uh, server entities. So it looks exactly like a local load balancer. And the last entity that we have is global servers. Uh, we uh, represent each server. This global server basically represents the entire local LB, and what it does is it actually monitors the LB, local LB itself, and it has all the WIPs that are configured, configured the public WIPs that are configured on that particular local LB. Uh, it will have the ports that it's configured on, and it will have monitoring on that, and it will have all those configurations here. So essentially what we have is uh, and representation of an entire local LB. So uh, GLB uh, is not there in V1, and I'm not sure, I don't think it's, uh, it's there in V2 also, LBASI V2 API. But uh, our business needs was to have APIs for this thing. So what we did last year is basically we implemented this in our, uh, in our eBay's proprietary load balancing management application. And these APIs are actually currently being used by eBay and PayPal uh, to uh, configure the global uh, load balancing, uh, uh, to configure our global load balancers. So the benefits of GLB. So what it does is uh, it provides you benefits like health monitoring. Uh, so basically what you can do is you can do health monitoring on local LBs as well as public webs. Um, this is, these are the things that you want, would not get on a DNS. Uh, so it provides other load balancing features like admin status, live status, and load balancing methods on GLB. So what it does is you can uh, you can pick the load balancing feature, uh, load balancing method that you want 
for the GLB to use when it wants to forward traffic to one of the public VIPs on each of these each of your regions. Um, you can configure that. You can also configure uh, the weight of each uh, public VIP. So let's say, for instance, uh, one pool in a one region is running really hot, and you don't want a lot of traffic to be forwarded to that. So you can configure the weight and can increase the weight on some other region. Which, which is not running that hot, and you can traffic, forward traffic to that. So you can use global load balancing uh, for that. And you can also uh, configure the number of VIP addresses. That is the max address return field. Uh, you can configure that also uh, with that. So, so th this is what are the benefits of GLB. Uh, migration use case. So earlier this year, we had to, uh, so we had to migrate our uh, current proprietary eBay uh, load manage load balancing management system to LBAS. So what we had is uh, we had OpenStack deployment in each of our regions, uh, but since we had not integrated OpenStack with LBAS, we had OpenStack integrated with our proprietary eBay LBAS, and then that proprietary eBay LBAS was talking to the LBAS device. Uh, so what we have is uh, that's our control plane, and then we had a bunch of VMs here on the right, uh, which are running, these are basically are the cloud which has applications and pools uh, and services. And then what we have is, this is our data plane path. So we have traffic going, uh, web traffic going uh, from our GTM, uh, from our GLBs, I'm sorry, to LB device, and from LB device it goes to the VM traffic. So what we had to do is we had to migrate uh, all of these to LBAS. So our goal was basically to migrate everything to LBAS, and we, and we had to do that uh, with no control and data plane impact. So what our goal was basically migrate all our existing entities from our eBay proprietary uh, LB, uh, load balancing application to LBAS. Uh, we had to honor all the existing LB entities that are um, there on the LB, which were configured by our eBay proprietary system. And we couldn't change any of those entities because we didn't want any data plane downtime. And we didn't want any control plane downtime also because we wanted our tenants to, um, to be able to uh, continue changing, uh, changing the entities that were uh, there on the LB. So, um, so the way we achieved this thing is, uh, first, first is uh, we worked with our vendors to basically change uh, their architecture a little bit so that when we do the migration, we don't make any changes to the LB devices. So that actually helps us um, uh, have no data plane impact. And then what we did is we wrote automation scripts to migrate all our LB entities from uh, our proprietary uh, load balancing management system to LBAS, uh, tenant by tenant. So what we do is we, we pull data from our, uh, from our eBay load balancing application and move them to LBAS. And during that time, so we just use APIs. So we call APIs from one place, we call APIs from the other system, and we sync data, we do it tenant by tenant. And once a tenant has migrated, uh, we want the Horizon UI to switch over to the new system. So the Horizon UI was basically talking to, before the migration, it was talking to the old system. And uh, then what we had is, for the time being, we had a Horizon UI talk to both the systems. And when the, for a given tenant, if the migration is done, it would talk to the new system. And if the migration is not done, it would talk to the old system. So we have a seamless plan to migrate all of these entities from, uh, from our syst old system to our LBAS system. We migrated all of the VMs. So we migrated over 1,000 plus WIPs uh, to LBAS uh, in a period of few weeks. And that also, we were able to achieve that without uh, any control plane and data plane impact. Um, so that was our migration. Um, the next thing that I would like to talk about is north, south, and east west load balancing. So this is a typical architecture that we follow for our uh, north, south, and east west load balancing. So what we have here is uh, we have VIP traffic um, coming from north, uh, first hit our firewall, and then from the firewall uh, it goes to the LB device, and from the LB device it goes to uh, each of these regions. Uh, VMs, uh, and uh, that depends on how the WIPs are configured on the LB. And then, and what we have is for our east-west traffic is basically for if one VM wants to talk to the second VM, another VM in the same region, we have another LB device in the cloud which does that. So our, our typical use case is uh, 
we have VMs running applications. So if we have a web tier application or an application layer tier, app tier application, what we have is they want to talk to the DB. So, so the web tier, so the web applications are on one VM and the database applications are on the other VM. So we have a VIP on top of our database application. That VIP is hosted in the Zelby device. So that's our east-west traffic. So this is how our east-west traffic topology works. And uh, uh, future work. So what we want to talk about this is future work. So we would like uh, uh, the OpenStack, we would like to work with the OpenStack community to actually build a, uh, the GSLV APIs. Uh, there is some integration that needs to probably happen with Designate because it has, uh, because it has to create uh, DNS records uh, for the global names. Uh, so there is some uh, integration that, so we would like to w work with the OpenStack community on the, on the global load balancing APIs. Uh, the other thing that we really want to work with the community on is bulk API to add members. So uh, we have requirements where um, we really want to flex up, that we call it basically burst, or increase the pool size uh, of a given pool from 100 to 500 members. And that has to happen in 60 seconds. Or uh, So in that case, Elba's V1 API does not have uh, uh, any bulk API. So there is uh, so to add a member to a pool, there's just one API call that you need to make. So that one API call will just add one member. So if you had to add 500 members to a pool, we didn't want to make 500 calls, right? So what we want to do is we want to work with the community on actually uh, supporting bulk APIs. So bulk APIs are basically, uh, you just call one API, you give a list of members, and it will add everything at once. So at once, what will happen is that Alpass will send all the member information to your LB device, uh, either via the controller or via the agent, uh, whichever provider you use. Um, and what it will do is it will make all those changes at once. So that, uh, so that way there is, uh, so that changes happens faster. Advanced LB scheduling. So the next thing we wanted to talk about is LB, LB scheduling because I see a lot of, uh, uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, potential in the LB scheduling um, uh, improvements in the LBAS scheduler that we could make. Uh, we could make schedulers a little smarter uh, uh, because in LBAS, if, you, if you're managing multiple LBs, you want some scheduling um, intelligence to figure out which LB to pick based on capacity, based on SLA. You know, there are various factors. I mean, we haven't deployed, uh, we haven't worked on all of them, uh, but we would like to work on all of them because if you wanted to migrate, uh, if you wanted to migrate a, a, all our all our load balances into LBAS, then we will need that thing. So we'll would like to work with the community on that front as well. Quota support. So one very important thing that we have is uh, that we don't have in LBAS is quota support. So um, so I think Neutron has some core uh, uh, intelligence, uh, core framework. I'm sorry, uh, with quota support. So uh, we would like to work with the community on on adding quota support to. Web. So basically, what we want is we want to control how many webs a tenant can create, so that way um, uh, we can uh, we can assign quotas exactly the way there are quotas for NOAAs, for NOAA and everything. So uh, so that's the future work that we have. Uh, this is our LBAS team uh, that uh, we have at eBay and PayPal, and um, uh, questions. No, no, no. It uh, it handles multi-tenant. So, oh, sorry. So the question was, uh, does the load balancer support multi-tenant? So yes, the load balancer does support multi-tenant. Uh, we uh, because the tenant information is forwarded to the scheduler, and the scheduler forwards it to the agents. So the tenant information is so it's tenant aware. So it does support multi-tenancy. So the question is uh, whether we use uh, uh, virtual networking. Sorry, you had two questions. I'm sorry. So what kind of LB device? 
No, no. So the so the LB device is virtual network aware because what we have is uh, we have the members in a virtual network, and the device needs to be configured for the virtual network. So without that, it cannot forward the web traffic from the LB device to the virtual network. So it is configured, and uh, it is. Uh, what was the second question? Sorry about uh, LB device. What type of LB device? Sorry. So so yeah. So we support various kinds of LB device. I mean that's the provider thing, right? So it's hardware, it's software. So we support various kinds of LB devices. So, uh, firstly, thank you. I mean, it was a pretty comprehensive, good presentation, so thanks for that. Um, my question is on the global load balancer. Uh, does the global load balancer, because that's not in the data path, right? Because it's really just giving a set of IP addresses out. And the local, so in your, in your global DNS scheme, mm -hmm. your global load balancer is just a C name, and so just giving IP addresses out, and it doesn't really know what's the data on the right, on the, right, and so it doesn't really know. It can't load balance on the data path. It's really load balancing based on some static algorithm. Right. So th that is correct. So what it does is, um, if you look at the data plane path, it's uh, it doesn't do any uh, uh, it doesn't do any um, data plane routing. What all it does is, uh, based on the configurations that's there on the global load balancer, it decides whether uh, to forward uh, whether to um, what what addresses to return back the public list of public addresses to return back, but um, since the global load balancer actually also so yeah that's right so yeah, it oh, does only in DNS right. as well yeah. Uh, is the GSLB patch available or it's not published yet? Sorry, could you repeat the question? The GSLB it. patch that you shown here. Uh huh. Is it available or? So the GSLB patch actually, so the GSLB uh, code, ba the code was not written for LPAS. It was written for our eBay proprietary system. So uh, we haven't, uh, because there was no integration, uh, because there were no drivers yet written by any of the vendors on the providers to talk to, Glob uh, to talk to GLB. So we couldn't write APIs for that. So, so the first, what we need to do is we need to work with the community on uh, a blueprint for all the GLB APIs, and then we need to work with all the providers to basically support, uh, add support for that in their drivers and their agents and our controllers, whichever path, uh, whichever deployment path they use. Thank you. No problem. Questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. What's it called? Send Lin. Yeah. Okay, I'll look at that. S E N L I. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I had a oops, wow. I had a question on the um, on the load balancer if it's an appliance. How do you plug that appliance to a logical network? Because I guess you're not using VLAN. So how do you make that load balancer to talk to that um, web tier uh, network, logical network? Oh, so you're talking how the local LB talks to uh, talks to the, the members, web tier right? subnet, yeah. The members, right? <clears throat> yeah. So we have to configure that on the LB device itself. Uh, so basically, we have to define routes on the LB device. So that is sort of a, a co onboarding configuration that we have to do. So we have to configure that. So oh. that doesn't change actually whether it's G GLB or I mean for GLB that doesn't matter. But that's yeah, for, for local SLB, LB. yeah, yeah. So actually in the diagram it's connected to the network where you have your workers, right. the the VMs, but physic uh, physically it's not the case. It's right. routed. Physically, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, so uh, the question was, how do we achieve HA between the agent and the load balancer, right? So, so the provider that we use, the way they have it designed is they have a one-to-one -one mapping between the agent and the LB. So one agent can only talk to one LB. Uh, but that is not HA, right? Because if the agent goes down, then you cannot talk to the LB. So what we did is basically we have the same, uh, we have multiple instances of the, uh, of the agent running. Um, we have the multiple, I'm sorry, we have multiple agent, uh, multiple instance of the agents 
installed, but only one is running. And by a pacemaker, what we do is we achieve HA. So if one uh, agent goes down, then we try to bring up a new instance of it. Uh, so and to add to Kunal's point, we also have two LB pairs. So you know, there's a primary and a secondary LB, right? Yes. So we so we you. have we have redundancy for LBs as well as redundancy for right. the agents via pacemaker. So the way we have is no, we have the LB we have uh, the LBs that we have deployed is in an active standby mode. So we have two instances running. Yeah, yeah, it's a process. Yeah. We have no more time for questions. Yeah. Questions come. Questions. Come up. Cool. Thank you.